Giles, how are you? I'm great, Dale. Great to be with you. How are you doing? Good, buddy. Great to have you back. Uh, what's top of mind as we go into Paul testimony? And I know we haven't spoken in about three, four months. Um, you excited about the month of March? Yeah, I'm really much more excited about FX generally this year as we've seen growth differentials, interest rate yep. differentials. It's really sort of come back alive. So I've been really, really enjoying it. Yeah, there's more differentiation between the pairs. Yeah, for sure. Year, and it's just, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you're getting these short term focuses on particular data points like economic data or inflation data. And so there's been a lot of short term trading opportunities. So even though the bigger picture has been unclear, that's been quite helpful for short term trading. So I've been really enjoying particularly economic risk events during the last couple of months. OK, what would you say the main uh, the main time frame you've been spending the most time on and generating the most trades from four hour hello well at least we can see giles's charts yeah can you can hear me right I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you just fine. Uh, you just fine. Yeah, here, here I am, guys. Sorry, I somehow muted myself. I don't know how. Yeah, you know that's that 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 happens, huh? and we're gonna we're gonna forgive you this time. Good to see <laughs> you, All right, buddy. All right, all right. So uh, I was asking you. Uh, you were saying that you know nothing real macro. Um, it's a little bit more muddled, but lots of trading opportunities. Are you? What time frame are you spending most of your time on and generating trades from the four hour? Yeah, well, um, there's two sort of time frames, sort of the, the the weekly and the monthly, and then the 15 minute chart. I found myself in those two extremes, either wow. you know, much bigger picture or very short term trading opportunities, just sort of scalping between pivot points, really on surprise data points, like a, you know a surprise inflation print or surprise surprise employment print, something like that. That was a real nice uh, reaction off that trend line Thursday in the s and p's yeah and, and like that was really follow in, through that was really interesting because I, I thought i'd just talk through this like remember that very strong non-farm payroll print we had on the third yeah. of feb right um when we had that five hundred and seventeen thousand print and that was above the maximum expectation of like 300 odd thousand so it was huge yeah. and it was an inflection point not only for s and p's but uh 10 year bottom what 353 yeah. and um you see it gold you, bottomed 1804 yeah anyway yeah. okay and you, you, no you're right Dale. and you actually you see it more clearly on the dollar index for instance i'm just flicking over there because you, you yeah. see that inflection much more clearly than the smp 500 here that yeah. on the on the on the friday the third um, right. And you just see how, you know, how much dollar buying came in. Now, the S&P 500 was in one sense seemingly slow to react, but it did top out that sort of 4150, 4200 region. And then we had the strong ISM data, strong retail sales. Then we had those two CPI and PPI prints, which although they were on trend falls, the month on month reading was high for both of them. And then we had the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, the core PCE print, which came in higher than expected. And I've just got that here. Um, let's just see it there. We had the core PCE print coming in on the 24th of Feb with the headline coming at 4.7% above the maximum expected of 4.5. And that month on month reading again coming in strong which is really interesting because we had the CPI came in strong month on month, the PPI, and then the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, the core PCE print came in hot month on month. And that's 0.6%. And the maximum expected was 0.3%. So all of that led to a repricing from the Federal Reserve. And now we've got a peak rate that's projected to be about 5.5% for July and the autumn of this year. And that's why everyone's expecting a more hawkish pal. But the question that I'm asking to myself is, will he be hawkish enough? Because if everyone's expecting a hawkish pal, and I think he will have to be hawkish. But unless he's going to put a terminal rate expectation above 6%, I think the risk is he'll, he'll sort of disappoint markets. 
So when we had this turn of the month, you know, you get this seasonal effect, Dale, of stocks tend to gain uh, the major indexes from the end of the month around the 26th to the 27th to about the third or the fourth. So I, I wasn't surprised to see this pick up, and I actually tweeted about it at the time, off that 200 moving average, that very large trend line. We'd seen a lot of stretch positioning, and now we've moved back up to today's prices, and then we're just hanging around wait, waiting for Powell. So one thing that I thought might be helpful for your listeners is to explain why the Fed are so focused on inflation. Um, and basically, there's this Phillips curve that the Fed are being informed by. And they have this belief that when unemployment is low and employment is high, that means workers can ask for higher wages, which leads to higher inflation. So in the Fed's mind, strong employment equals high inflation. And, and the vice versa is true as well. So which is I'm, very far away from being true, by the way. Yeah. So, so what I'm looking for, Powell, is maybe he'll start casting doubt on this Phillips curve idea. So maybe he'll start saying, well, maybe we can have a scenario where we have you know, low unemployment and it doesn't become inflationary. So I think one tail risk to look out for is if he starts distancing himself from this view and thinks, well, maybe we can have our cake and eat it. And maybe the Phillips curve is not applying in the way that we're expecting. Now, historically, this Phillips curve sort of oscillates quite a lot from this perfect kind of, you know, model. Um, but this is what's driving them, which is why their favorite measure of labor expenses is employment cost index. They want to see the labor market weakening to give them confidence that they're winning the inflation battle. So labor equals inflation in, in, in the Fed's mind. So I'm just wanting to see if we get some kind of distancing from him about that. Um, so, that, you know, that's sort of what I'm looking for, and you know, over today and tomorrow. And one thing that's interesting for your listeners is this. If you look at this semi-annual testimony over the last 15 years, from a seasonal perspective, the seasonal bias is for the S&P 500 to gain into the semi-annual testimony. The, the colloquial... Which it did. Yeah, which it did, right? The Humphrey Hawkins testimony is the sort of the shorthand for it. And then yeah. to gain for the couple of days out of it. So yeah. that's over the last sort of 29 events in the last 15 years. So what I'm looking for here is if I get a dovish pal, I would use that for a short-term opportunity in the S&P 500, but it's an if. And the caveat for this, Dale, is if you look at it over 25 years, you actually see the opposite pattern over 50 events, up into the testimony, and then down the days after the testimony. So, you know, if he's very hawkish, but in my mind, very hawkish, he's got to push that terminal rate expectations over 6%, really, um, for that to be considered hawkish considering how far we've come since that really strong non-farm payroll print that we got on um, February the 3rd, which topped out the, the S&P 500. So that's kind of my my grid really there, Dale. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm conscious uh, I've I talked, just, talked a lot. I'm sorry about that. Well, I, we, I, you know, you learn from listening. So my takeaway from you today, Giles, is, you know, uh, you're going to... Uh, uh, hope that the market waits for you to get in after you decide whether or not he's hawkish or, or dovish. I'm just kidding you. Um, <laughs> uh, but but really, the takeaway, and it's great, is uh, at least we have some guideposts now for what would be considered hawkish. And that would yeah. mean if he talked to terminal rate over six, and we should be on the lookout of him to start distancing himself from the Phillips curve, which yeah. would give him more latitude uh, for employment to stay strong without yeah. tightening us into oblivion. Yeah, ex it, that's, that's it? it in a nutshell, Dale. Okay. Uh, what, you have any view on gold? Uh, we had a nice bounce last week. We've given back about half. About half. What do you think? 
So with gold, um, I always look at um, the interplay between real yields, the dollar, okay. and gold to get my bearing on it. So I haven't looked at gold for a while, but if if Powell was dovish, that would be bullish gold. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking at um, where the dollar is. So if we see a dovish Powell, I expect the dollar to fall. I'd also expect 10-year yields to fall. So I'd expect real yields to drop. So I'd expect that to be bullish for gold. So the same environment that we bullish for the S&P were they dropped? They weren't really dropping on that first wave up, though, Giles. That first wave up in gold, yields were rising. Yes, but it's the were relationship they? between the two. So okay. what I like, Dale, is when I'm trading, is I like to see the dollar and real yields moving together. Yeah, okay. Whereas if you see them moving, it like diverging, like in December, you see how you've, yeah. you've got real yields heading that way you've got the dollar heading that way you can't i still do trade gold but the, the best scenario is with when they're both moving together that's when you get those real high conviction moves that i look for for swing trading all right so you're strongly neutral gold right now um yeah but the if i was long s p 500 i'd also use that as a potential opportunity to get long gold all and, one market all one yeah. market isn't it okay and it's all you get the dollar right, you get everything else right. Don't yeah, especially especially with all the focus on inflation right now and the way yeah. that the dollar and yields are going to be so sensitive to interest rate expectations. So it's kind of like the same. It's a, it's a different expression of the same narrative. Okay. Well, talking to you, Giles, is like cash in the bank. Which so, you, you can break it down, you see. And once, once you know yeah. the expectations... That like I found that that's been very good for like short term trading opportunities. You know, yes, I can't see the bigger picture, but I can see what the market's expecting for the next three to six hours, uh, and and that's where I've been sort of trading recently, and I've been quite enjoying it. Okay, all right. Well, uh, really appreciate your your views. Uh, a quick, uh, I know the currencies, like you said. Uh, They've been pretty choppy. I mean, there've been some, you know, Euro Aussie, but just the dollar pairs. Uh, uh, the tightest range I could remember in cable for many years, basically 400 pip range. Do you have an expectation as to what side of the range cable's gonna come out of, or maybe both? Maybe we try the bottom first, clean out the longs, and then blow out the shorts over 2450? Yeah, that is a, that is a very tight range. I hadn't I hadn't noticed how tight that range had gone. Yeah, what do you um, do? You put on a volatility spread where you you buy puts and calls because you know there's a move coming, one way or the other. You just don't know which way <laughs> first. So yeah, let's have just have a look at that. Yeah, so you have got this sort of coiling. You have got this coiling price action. You're right, and that's uh, typically, and it's still in that sort of supply area from that yeah. January. It's very strong hammer reversal bar. So this is a very, we're still in very strong support around that 1.1200 regions. That that would be, technically that would be my first observation. We're in major support as we are, um, and then I'd be I'd be using the dollar as my cue because there's been a lot of negativity priced in for the pound, um, and any sort of good news uh, for the pound, the pound would be very sensitive to good news. So if I had a strong reason to short the dollar, then I would trade the pound. And I could tell you a little technical tip that, that works very nicely is when you have these sort of very coiling price actions like this, yeah. what you could do is just draw that, that trend line across the top. Now, I know technicians would say that's not a trend line because you haven't got three touches. But what I found, Dale... And this is particularly if you've got a strong technicians will Giles, just not technical anal is. <laughs> yeah, well, to to be, to be fair, some Dale, people I get pretty anal get about TA, you know. So anyway, yeah, yeah, I know, but you know, when people want to get it right, I I, I can understand the the heart <laughs> behind it. But what yeah. I've noticed is if you combine this with a strong narrative, so even though there's two touches there. The fact that these are swing points, and this will be obvious yeah. to anyone who spent any time trading. Uh, yeah, you is, can't be sure cable over that. Yeah, I mean, you can see these little um, candlesticks. And if you just draw a line across the top of those swing points, with all that selling you've seen there, 
if price yeah. breaks back above that trend line, it's, it's it'd be really significant. So if I was okay. if I was thinking, you know, I want to go long cable, I would I would look at it two ways. Either I would buy and put my stop underneath one point one nine hundred, say I'm in key support, or I'd wait for a breakout of that one point two one hundred region. And if I break out of one point two one hundred, I'd stay with it as long as I keep above that trend line. Um, but I would need a negative US dollar story to do that. So I'd need to see some kind of peak terminal rate signaled or maybe say a real big miss of the non-farm payroll on Friday. So say, for instance, if we got along to Friday and we had the headlines expected to come in at 200,000, I think. Yeah, so you see the headlines expected to come in at 200,000. Um down from the prior 517,000. Say it came in below 100,000 and say the average hourly earnings also came in 0.2%, ideally below 0.2% and say the participation rate was 62.4% or better and say the average hourly earnings also fall below 4.4%, then that would be a great opportunity to go long pound US dollar and I would expect that technical pattern to break. So I would expect that to break out on that kind of print. So that's what I'd look for. Or as you say, Dale, if Powell is more hawkish today, we might get a bit more dollar strength. So then you might get the pound moving down and you could get a sort of a false break of this 1.1800 region and then get a snap back higher. So I'd be, I'd be looking at either buying at 1.1860 if we saw a hawkish Powell I buy from this area here, then markets will be likely to sort of move back into the range awaiting the non-farm payroll. And then if you've got a weak print, you might push higher. So if someone put a gun to my head and said, how could you make money from this structure? They would be the, they would be some of the ways that I'd be looking at, but I'm not doing any of them, but that's what I do. Okay. All right. Best way for people to follow you? Um, Giles, uh, the best contact way? Contact you and... Yeah, um, is just come along to the HYCM blog. Okay. And I put like lots of different information up there every day, central bank stuff, risk events. Um, and that's the only sort of avenue uh, of contact that I'm allowed to share with my compliance, unfortunately. So well, right. I'm not being, okay. uh, I'm not being evasive. No, I know you want, I, I know you like uh, to share your insights with people. So yeah uh, that's how that's how you find giles and what he's thinking and uh once again giles i appreciate you coming in kind of before you know we say this every week uh, this week is critical it does feel like this week is gonna tell us whether last week was real or not yeah yeah so, uh, yeah. absolutely i think yeah it really is a it's 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 such a critical week but the one there's one thing that i keep coming back to though is the Fed's going to still peak at some point. If it's not, if it's not now, as in the summer, it'll be a little bit later. So, it, it, in one sense, you know, you don't want to get too much caught up in the hype. You know, if you take a longer term view, the, the, the you know the Fed pivots. It's a question of it's a question of when, not if. Okay, that that's the art of it. Yeah, that's the timing of it. But um, yeah, that's the art of uh, yeah. everything that we do. Is the yeah. Way. All right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I look forward to when <laughs> we get together again. Yeah. On the road, Jaws. Yeah, that's been it's been great. Dale. Great to be with you all. And um, yep. thanks for having me. Yeah, have a great spring trade uh, trading season. And thanks. And uh, keep in touch on Twitter and really appreciate you coming in and uh, giving us a couple of guideposts for us to kind of fit in to what Paul says today. Yeah, you don't I'll think ask. he'll cry. You don't think he'll break down or, and cry or anything today, do you? No, I just think he has to be more hawkish. But even a hawkish pal, I don't think that's necessarily going to be a surprise. Okay. All right. Everyone <laughs> looking for the same thing. Giles Coughlin, everybody. Thank you, buddy. Thanks. Yeah, cheers, Dale. Take care now. See you, everyone. All right. Bye. All right. That's a wrap, everyone.
you follow Giles on Twitter at Giles Coughlin, and he has some uh, letters afterwards, some type of designation. And you could join the team in 21 minutes for the morning edge so that uh, you're ready with levels to trade Paul's testimony. Good luck today, everyone. Good hunting, and don't just count your pips, count your blessings. Have a great turnaround Tuesday. Adios. Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.